welcoming Dr. Wright. Thank you, sir. And thanks to y'all for coming. This is a, a privilege and an honor. Uh, I would be able to give this presentation, I think, maybe at six colleges or universities in the entire United States uh, at this point. Uh, it's highly controversial stuff. So, yeah, tough noogies, right? <laughs> You're here voluntarily. This is college. You should be challenged with morally and empirically difficult stuff, right? So here we go. Economics of slavery, then and now. Other places I would have to say, well, economics is a dirty word, right? So I'd have to say stuff about enslaved persons. <laughs> uh, and I'm not, I'm not kidding about that either, unfortunately. So uh, slavery? Now, generally, slavery is binary, right? You think of people being a slave or being not a slave, being free, being a slave based on legal status. I think of it a bit differently. I came up with, as I was trying to find a definition for slavery, I came up with 20 questions. Not like the 20 questions is a game. I mean, I played it. Did you play it? 64 questions. 64? Whoa, genius. <laughs> or no, wait. No, no, no. Oh, that was a talk show. No, I'm talking about a game that you'd play. You'd try to figure out what somebody had in mind. You'd play 20 questions, an animal, mineral, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so I quantify the degree of enslavement by measuring the, uh, the volition that a worker reveals through their answers to, this, uh, to these 20 questions. And I came across this because there were sports figures who I don't want to name, I don't think I could name at this point, but maybe some of you know who I'm talking about, who uh, played for like NBA teams and NFL teams and whatnot, and they said that they were slaves because they had to go to certain locations to play. Right, they could get. <laughs> you a sports fan? Yeah, it's kind of. Uh, do you know who I'm talking about? No. Um, it, it was more than one on different different occasions. You know, I, we're, we're basically slaves. Um, you know, the NBA is also like 95% African American or something like that too. So there was that that whole connection there. But and I thought thought about it. And I thought, well, no, that's just silly. But you do have a point. That is slave. Like, that is a characteristic of many enslaved persons over time is that they were told where they could live, where they, where they had to work, and so on and so forth. So they weren't completely off base, but then there's a bunch of other stuff that, was, you know, they're not slaves. Or, or they're not very much um, enslaved. So just to, just to give you some, um, uh, some, some, some idea, so zero to four is like the... Uh, the range that I found with the archetypical southern U.S. plantation slave before the Civil War. They, you know, I, I answered the 20 questions for them, obviously, using the historical literature, and some score zero. They, they had no volition whatsoever, and these are the ones that were on huge cotton plantations, worked in gang uh, systems, um, they, they were owned lock, stock, and barrel, you might say, by the plantation owners. Had, had, there were others who worked on task systems in like the rice uh, fields of South Carolina um, that weren't worked all day. They were worked by the task. As soon as they completed the task, the rest of the day was theirs. So they had a little bit more volition. So they scored between zero and four uh, on, on my scale. Um, CEOs and tenured college professors tend to score 19 to 20 on my scale. To give you a, you know, uh, and the, so the, the sports figures were one. I really started thinking about this when I ran across owners of businesses who said that they were slaves. Because they worked long hours. <sighs> yeah, on your own business. <laughs> um, so... Uh, and, and most U.S. workers today score around a, a 15 on my, on my scale. So most people wouldn't consider that 
enslaved, but they also they don't have full, uh, you know, the full, full right to do whatever they want to say or whatever they want to do whenever they want to want to do it. Uh, and in fact, just so you all know, if you go out and get, um, you know, private sector jobs, First Amendment doesn't apply to you as an employee. That's about the government. That's about you. So. Um, if you land a, a job with a private employer and they say you shouldn't talk about fancy math, um, <laughs> she's got a shirt with an equation on it, um, then, uh, you know, don't do it or you could, you can get fired and there's nothing, nothing that you can do about it. So that, that decreases your degree of freedom a, a little bit, but uh, in and of itself it's not a, a, a loan, uh, enough to, to, to make you, um, uh, 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 slavish. So uh, some of the questions included um, things like, is the laborer paid primarily in liquid assets? Right? Cash. Um, there's a long history in the United States of workers not being paid in cash. They were paid in uh, company scrip, it was called. It was good only at the company store. So that obviously decreases your, <laughs> your, your freedom if you, if you uh, uh, aren't, aren't, aren't paid in cash. Is the laborer free from uh, physical restraints? That's a kind of obvious one. We all think of the slave, you know, that iconography of the slave, you know, with his, his hands bound and, you know, am I not a, a man and a brother, that sort of thing. He's got physical chains uh, on there. But there, there are other sorts of uh, physical, uh, physical restraints. In fact, I did not bring this, but this prop was just magically here. Um, do you guys still have corporal punishment here? What is this? It's, <laughs> he said yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll put that down then. Um, <clears throat> is the laborer incapable of uh, uh, owing his or her employer significant sums of money or being listed as collateral uh, security? This one comes about because uh, many people have been kept in uh, labor situations they didn't want to be into via uh, debt laws. Um, in this country and in other countries, and in India to this, uh, to this day. Uh, can the laborer quit without uh, loss? Uh, can the laborer determine uh, his or her own name? Now again, we, we know exceptions uh, to this, like um, Marilyn Monroe, you know who that is? Was that her real name? No, that was some stage name, it was a contract name. There's some Elton John? That's a stage name too, right? Uh, there, there, there are a bunch of uh, Madonna? Was Madonna born Madonna? No? No? Uh, Nas X? Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm starting to get blank stares like, Madonna? You mean the Madonna? What are you talking about? Uh, um, a singer. That, not even worth getting into, but uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so, um, but, uh, you know, uh, that is not, uh, you know, just because you, you don't control your, your own name doesn't mean that you're, you have no other volition in other areas of, of life, right? So Marilyn Monroe was not a slave. Maybe a love slave to JFK, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> Somebody pays attention. Okay. So the economics of slavery then and now? Are there slaves in the world today? Yeah, there are. In fact, there was, a, there was a big movie that came out, or it was a small movie, but it got big. I saw it and I forgot the name. It's got a weird name. Sound, Sound of Freedom. Yes, did you see it? No, did anyone here see it? Yeah? Uh, I thought it was not a well-executed movie, but it was good in that it, uh, you know, it raised awareness, as they say, uh, about the situation. Um, now, in, in many uh, Christian um, settings, this has been known for, for, for some time, um, but uh, you know, people forget about things, or they know about something, and they try to help, they screw up, and then they want to forget about it like some of those Christian groups in the 1990s discovered that there were Christians in the, the Horn of Africa, and there are Christians in the Horn of Africa, they're Coptics, they're like a way, way old uh, uh, sect of Christianity, were being enslaved. They could not stomach this, so they went and they came up with the bright idea 
of paying to emancipate these Christians. Oh, good, I'm getting some good. This is Econ Club, right? Do you know what happened? Suddenly there were lots and lots of slaves, yeah. They were people who uh, they essentially shared the, the, the payments with to pretend that they were enslaved, right? Um, but also, in a more general term, when you pay for something, you're, you're um, uh, incentivizing the creation of that thing. So, um, yeah, it's not a good idea to, to, pay, um, to, to pay for... Um, uh, for emancipation. So about 40 million people, give or take, uh, almost all technically uh, are, are, are illegal, right? So it's hard to get numbers on it. It's like, it's like the drug trade. I mean, how, how much fentanyl is there really? Or how much meth? I mean, we can estimate, but we don't really know, right? So the estimate is about 40 million people uh, worldwide, which means that this is probably the highest absolute numbers of um, people enslaved throughout history. But it might be the lowest percentage of human beings <laughs> enslaved throughout history. And that's because, of course, we have the largest population of human beings on, on Earth right now. So 7 billion or 8 billion? 8.5 billion, yeah. So 40 million is a lot of individual, but it's a, it's a very small, very small uh, in, in percentage terms. Slavery uh, began in prehistory. Uh, we know this because the first writings talk about slaves, and also archaeologists have found artifacts that are very difficult to explain without, um, uh, with, without, uh, without slavery um, being, being around. It was also found in every major society. Sometimes, you know, we have all these myths about different groups of people and the, and the way they, you know, are or were or whatever. Sometimes you'll, oh no, the Indians didn't have slaves. Well, that's baloney. Number one, there is no the Indians. There were many, many tribes. <laughs> and there, there was variation in um, uh, different tribes and, and the amount of, uh, of, of slavery that they have. But some of them uh, made, made the, you know, the antebellum South, gave them a good run for their money, like the Northwest Coast um, Indians, the one with the totem poles. Yeah, they had uh, lots and lots of slaves. But even the, the Plains Indians, um, you know, like the Lakota and whatnot, who, who you would think might not, given um, you know, their nomadic lifestyle, uh, would trade in human beings. Um, in fact, 1883 fans, anyone? Really? Okay, well, screw Elsa Dutton. Um, the, the story about her. Uh, any, anyway, so, um, yeah, and in Europe, too. Sometimes people think that Europeans just enslaved brown peoples from throughout the world. And they did do that, but they also enslaved each other. In fact, our word for slave, the English word for slave, is derived from the word Slav, because the Slavs were a major source of <laughs> slaves in Europe for, I don't know, 500 years, 1,000 years, something like that. All those years start to, start to sort of run together. But um, yeah, for, 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 a very long, for a very long time. In most um, societies, uh, the root word is servant, um, or, or, or service, or servus. Um, so yeah, slavery is ubiquitous throughout time and space uh, and culture. It's not usually racialized, but as uh, I will talk about, uh, there are economic reasons for enslaving the other uh, rather than... Uh, People from from your own from your own group, it's basically to reduce the uh, the the control costs, and also the likelihood that one will be uh, enslaved uh, oneself. So uh, probably, and there's no way to prove this. Otherwise, I would I would actually make a bet on it. Um, everyone in this room has an ancestor 
who was a slave, at least one, uh, and one who was an enslaver or a slave owner. Right? So I'm like uh, half Irish. Well, guess what? Those shows the, uh, on the History Channel about the Vikings and all of that, yeah, they actually did raid the Emerald Isle for human beings. My ancestors, yeah. Uh, also, a part of um, slavery has always been sex. So, I'm sure one or more of my ancestors was the product of an enslaved Irish woman and some Viking, which might ex explain why I like pickled herring so much. Um, but anyway, so, so uh, economics of all this with this uh, background. Uh, I'm going to talk about the treatment of slaves, a, a geographical model of slave prices. Uh, those are pretty easy. Labor choice demand model for slaves. That gets a, a bit more intense. Uh, then talk a little bit about the slave efficiency, productivity, uh, profitability debates. And then uh, where I'm most active in the negative externalities or dead weight loss uh, curve ball. So uh, first we should talk about the sources of slave supply. Uh, one is wartime capture. And the idea here was it's okay to enslave someone if you have uh, you know, defeated them in war and the, res and the option is to enslave them or to kill them. Right, and the, the, there was this old uh, Latin saying, and I for, I've forgotten the exact terminology, but basically, uh, if you are the one captured and you would rather die, you can do that. Just don't listen to your master and he or she will dispatch you, you know, soon, soon enough. Uh, punishment for a crime, again, rather than death. Uh, figuring out how to punish people who break laws and social more is maybe the trickiest thing. It's very, very difficult to, to, to get this to any degree of, yeah, I, I mean, you, you kill somebody, it's so, it's so final, but uh, the, same, the same sort of thing. So um, we could kill you because of what you did, supposedly, but we're just going to enslave you instead. And... You can accept that, or you can resist it and, and suffer, suffer the, the capital punishment. Uh, birth. This one gets a little trickier, but the idea is, how dare you female slave get pregnant from me raping you, be the enslaver, right? Uh, I could put you to death for that, or not, and just enslave whoever comes out eight to nine months later. Repayment of a debt, rather than imprisonment, which we used to do, <laughs> uh, or death for owing a debt that you can't repay. Enslavement was another uh, option, another source of supply. And then the, the, the morally uh, most reprehensible supply is just capture the weak or the feckless. Uh, th those who are unlucky, whatever, um, an innocent victim, if you will, and enslave them just because you have the power uh, to, uh, to do so. Whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. So the treatment of slaves, the hypothesis here is how well or poorly the median slave is or was treated as a function of the incentives of the enslaver or slaveholder. So today, slavery is technically illegal uh, throughout the globe. There are a couple of countries where it's, you know, kind of kind of uh, uh, wink winked. But um, what this means is that most of the enslaved are what Kevin Bales calls disposable. They can be purchased for just a few dollars to just a few thousand dollars if they're an attractive uh, young woman, 
especially a virgin. Um, but uh, in the in the scheme of things, not a lot of not a lot of money. And so basically, um, they're kept only so long as their marginal output is greater uh, than the marginal cost of replacing them. Uh, there are some places where multi-generational slavery still persists, like in Indian debt uh, peonage uh, bondage. Uh, some countries still allow chattel slavery. Uh, it's not legal on the books, sort of legal, but it's legal in the way that, uh, you know, no law enforcement officer is going to come and arrest you because you have, because, if, come on, everyone's got it. We're all doing it, you know. It's like marijuana use in some, <laughs> in some, some places, you know. It's just kind of, yeah, it's illegal, but, um, you know, de facto, uh, it's not. So the, the slaves are treated better there um, so that they can reproduce and their offspring also be uh, enslaved. So whenever the marginal cost of raising a child uh, from a baby is less than the marginal cost of buying uh, an, a, an equivalent. And we see this in uh, the antebellum United States, and this is where a lot of people goof up and make statements about how well the, the slaves were treated in the US. Um, in relative terms, they were chattel slaves, they were owned, the offspring uh, would uh, be owned by the slaveholder of uh, the mother of the slave. Um, they, so they, they were rarely killed or maimed. Now you read Uncle Tom's Cabin, Simon Legree and all of that. There were a few instances of that. It was not systemic though. It wasn't in their best uh, interest. There were doctors and hospitals in places like New Orleans that specialized in the care of slaves. Now, this doesn't mean that the slaveholder was going to mortgage his plantation in order to save, you know, a 50-year-old field hand. But if the 50-year-old field hand was sick, you know, he might have another 10, good 10 years in him. Send him to the doctor, see what the doctor has to say. The doctor says this is going to cost you a dollar to fix him up right. No problem, right? Fix him up. If the uh, doctor says, well, uh, it's probably going to cost you a hundred or so, then the slave owner says, bye bye right? So it reduces uh, the, the, the life of the slave basically to the discounted um, uh, future expected um, productivity of, uh, of the slave. Um, there are instances where some slaves became superannuated. Uh, this means too old to really even produce enough for their own, their own subsistence. Uh, they generally were not killed at that point. Uh, this is where some of the, some of the uh, rhetoric came out um, from some of the slavery apologists saying that uh, slavery is basically a social welfare system because we take care of our aged and indigent slaves without mentioning that very few ever lived that long and when they did reach that status they had a way of dying uh, not long afterwards so uh, you know, you don't uh, really, you know, see a hundred year old <laughs> slaves who haven't done any work for 20 years, um, you know, uh, uh, around uh, like, um, you know, some, some, some people uh, later on. Before we judge them too harshly though, uh, I haven't seen any empirical studies on that. I'm not sure how you could do it, but just anecdotally because of uh, some of my family members being in uh, the nursing home uh, business. It's amazing how soon after people's resources run out that they die in nursing homes. I'm not saying, I'm just saying uh, it's, uh, it, it, uh, it se seems to uh, go hand in hand. Uh, geographical model of slave prices. By the way, I should have mentioned, stop me at any point if you have a question. 
going to get harder. The hypothesis here is that a slave's price, holding everything else constant, of course, uh, will increase as a function of the distance of the slave from his or her source of origin. This can be physical distance, uh, especially in earlier times, but also cultural distance. Right, so it, it might only be 100 miles, but if that 100 miles you know, goes from being like a, a European language and mode of living to an Asiatic one, that could be quite a, quite a um, cultural uh, a difference. And um, the, so we tend to see slaves traded away from their source of origin just through arbitrage, because at the next village, they're worth a little bit more than in this village, and the village after that, and the village on the other side of that big river, they're even more uh, valuable. And we can see this uh, in patterns uh, throughout the historical uh, uh, period. So we see in British North America, the colonists preferred African over American Indian slaves all else equal because the American Indian slaves are relatively close to home physically and culturally they could escape in the woods have a chance of living making it if not back to their own tribe at least to a tribe who could understand their language and their life ways and whatnot um, African slaves very little chance of escaping and making it to Africa. And in fact, um, I don't know if any of them ever did. Uh, instead, they form maroon communities. They go into back, back woods, back swamp areas and try to set up their own, uh, their own societies um, because uh, they, they couldn't flee back to their, their place of uh, origin. American Indians also preferred African slaves over European slaves for the same reason. A white colonist who's enslaved by the Iroquois in upstate New York, where I was uh, born, born and raised, could relatively easily escape and make their way to a colonial settlement and get away. If the African escapes and makes his way to a white settlement in the colonial period, guess what's going to happen to him or her? They're going to be enslaved, right? So, oh, you want to be enslaved by the Indians or do you want to be enslaved? Either way. Um, then we go to Africa and we find that African enslavers tended to sell or barter away locally sourced slaves while trading for more distantly so, um, uh, sourced ones. So you'll see west, west coast of Africa slavers trading with east coast of Africa slavers. You know, why are they doing that? Well, just to get the people away from their point of origin so they are more easily uh, controlled. And that gets us to the labor choice or demand model. So all I'm doing here is comparing the costs and the benefits of, yeah, he took a picture. That's probably the smart thing to do. Because li literally, take a picture, it'll last longer, right? <laughs> uh, that's, the, that's the same. Um, and you can have these slides, by the way. You, know, you don't even have to take a picture. Give them to Al, and Al will put them on some Hillsdale Econ Club site or something like that. Um, there you go. Uh, oh yeah, that's right, because it's being recorded. Um, you'll be demonetized after this, you realize. Uh, so yeah, all I'm doing here, the, the W stand for wage, wage labor and the S for slave labor. And I'm just saying that what um, employers do is they compare the 
net benefits of using wage labor versus the net benefits of using slave labor versus the net benefits of using other types of labor, because there are other types of laborers. There's family um, laborers. There are, um, uh, there's this class uh, known as indentured servants that are on like long-term contracts, uh, which is part of the reason why I came up with that 20 point scale, because they're not quite slaves, but they're also not quite, uh, have as much volition as, as wage laborers or what have you. But um, so it's just, yeah, the, the productivity of wage workers plus the liquidity of wage workers, how easy are they to, uh, you know, to acquire various points in time that are easier than other, other points in time, right? These are all variables. They change over time, time and place. Uh, I just came from a vacation in South Dakota. I have a buddy out there who uh, runs the Taco, the Taco Bells in South Dakota. Yes, there are a few, um, <laughs> a dozen, I think. Um, the unemployment rate in South Dakota, does anyone know? It's less than 2%. There is constant turnover there. So uh, just jokingly, he's talked about using slaves because it's so hard to find wage workers. Yeah, I'm like, dude, thanks for proving my equation. Um, so the liquidity and the productivity minus the costs, and the cost, is the, the hype is um, short for um, the, um, the uh, uh, hypocrisy, thank you. Somebody can, somebody can read the screen better than I can from closer. The, the hypocrisy, so um, different types of laborers come with different amounts of social costs. It's one way to think about it. In our society today, in Hillsdale, wage labor, you know, no problem whatsoever. But at different times in the past, different societies, or different societies now, wage laborers are, their use, that's not good. That's not good, right? Because uh, you don't pay them enough, or whatever they come up with. Um, so that could be zero, but it could, could, could also be uh, uh, positive. Uh, minus the control costs. And again, these are very, they change over time and place and with different type of laborer. Uh, today in the US, the, con the control cost of wage laborers tends to be pretty low. And a place like Hillsdale or South Dakota is very low. But you go a little bit east of here, and it gets a little bit higher. What's going on in Detroit right now? Not a whole lot. Because they're on strike, right? Or is that still happening? Yeah. 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 Okay. So they're so they're on strike. So that, that's a type of control cost with wage uh, labor. Yeah, and changes over time. Back during the Great Depression, when the government was all gung ho and was you know pu pushing strong labor, um, uh, you know l labor legislation, it was much higher than it got subsequently. You know, uh, many many states um, uh, started to formulate these uh, right to work. Uh, laws that um, you know uh, ban things like uh, closed closed shops. You know where they force you into labor labor unions. I was forced into a labor union once at NYU. Made to join because I adjuncted there before I went went full time, and all the adjuncts had to be in a union. Right? They were pushing for three thousand dollars a course, and I'm like, I make thirty thousand dollars a course. What is this union doing for me? I was doing a lot for them, though, because I had to pay union dues that were a fraction of my... Anyway, um, control costs of wage labor. So then you start to think about this in terms of uh, other types of laborers, because you, you're doing a comparison. You're trying to figure out which one is the best for you as an employer to use. Uh, and you can see things like... Uh, We'll talk about slave productivity and whatnot later. The slave liquidity, how easy is it to buy and sell uh, slaves? Again, it varies over time and place, but in the antebellum US, there was a vigorous internal market uh, for, um, for slaves. So that was 
that was quite, uh, 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 quite high. Uh, hypocrisy, though. Ooh, this is where the abolitionists come in. They're trying to raise those hypocrisy costs. They're saying slavery is bad. They're saying it's against the Bible. That doesn't sound like a good thing. Especially, you know, in 19th century America when almost everyone purported to be highly religious, right? You have all these Southern Baptists in the South. You got these Northern Yankee women saying that what you're doing is wrong. So they fought against that with pro-slavery arguments. They fought against it by passing a gag order in Congress saying no more petitions to Congress about how bad the, uh, uh, slavery is. They stopped the mails, the M-A-I-L-S, pamphlets and whatnot, going into the, into the South in order to keep that hypocrisy value from getting too, too high. And then finally, there's the control cost of slaves. It turns out most people don't want to be enslaved. Even when they're born into it, which by the antebellum South period, you know, most of them are, so we banned the external uh, slave trade. There was, there was smuggling, but you know, it wasn't a high percentage of the total. But even people born into it didn't want to be slaves. Imagine that, right? So if you don't want to be a slave, what do you do? Well, if well, <laughs> yeah, you can try to you can try to escape. Absolutely, um, you uh, you cannot work, right? But then you're probably just going to get whipped or thrown in a hot box and, and whatnot. So they found all kinds of ways of resisting and resisting. Uh, sometimes, and the you know you hear about them in history class. Uh, they had some rebellions and whatnot. Th those got quashed. Um, they did have an effect, though, um, as, we'll, as we'll see. But, uh, you know, oh, Massa, I sick. Oh, Massa can tell the, the overseer to tell the slave driver, make him work. But what if he really is sick? He might end up costing me a dollar or two at the doctor. So maybe I'll give him a day off. Yeah? Even though it turns out he wasn't sick. The percentage of barns that burned in the antebellum south was an order of magnitude higher than the barns that burned in the north. Why would that be? Southern corn's a lot more flammable than northern corn? It was probably the slaves uh, getting a little, getting a little happy, you know. Massa wasn't very good to us. You know, he'll get hit. Um, all kinds of uh, what the slave owners called theft. Um, you know, a pig would go missing. The slaves would seem unusually hat and, uh, uh, fat and happy the next day. Yeah, you know, little little smell of pork in the air. Right? <laughs> So all kinds of, of control uh, costs uh, with using using with using family um, members, by the way, too. Um, <laughs> if any of you have uh, had the um, had the wonderful experience of working for a family business like I did, um, growing up on a on a on a horse farm, you know, there were, there were mornings that before kindergarten, I just did not want to get up and go and uh, pick, pick the stalls. Right. Yeah, so I didn't. What's the old man gonna do? <laughs> but then that leads to hypocrisy costs, right? So, okay, uh, I don't wanna belabor that point. Slave efficiency, productivity, profitability debate. This is the main uh, area of contention in slave economic and historiography. 
So were the slaves more or less efficient than non-slave uh, laborers. In other words, holding inputs constant, did the marginal slave produce more or less output than the marginal free laborer? Uh, were slaves more or less productive than non-slave laborers? In other words, which type of laborer produced more per person? Were slaves more profitable than employing free laborers? Was investing in chattel slaves as remunerative as investing in other assets? Right? You could buy a slave, but you could also buy a railroad bond. Railroad bonds don't set barns on fire and steal hogs, right? Yeah? They don't, they're not a threat to slit your throat uh, in the middle of the night uh, either. So uh, you have classical liberals like Adam Smith they, who tended to argue that slaves are less efficient, less productive, and less profitable than free workers because they lack incentives to work harder, smarter, faster, or longer, right? Make sense? But then this raises the weird conundrum of, then why did so many people own slaves? And Smith answered it basically by saying they enjoyed the power. Right? They were getting utility. <laughs> it wasn't just about the money, it was also the utility of having people you could boss around. Right? We, we, if you've had a job, you probably had a boss at one time or another who seemed to just enjoy telling people what to do, right? Um, and also, for the, ma for the male ones, and sometimes the female ones, they liked having people around who they could have relations with. Liaisons. Liaisons, yes. Dangerous liaisons. But, um, some economists uh, came along and claimed that slaves are more efficient and profitable because of an embedded option. So there's two, two ways you can work it with a, with a slave, right? You can work the slave like, essentially like a wage laborer with incentives. You be a good, hard-working slave, and you're going to get higher rations. I'm going to allow you to see this person on another plantation who I know that you're, you're keen on seeing, right? That, that's that sort of thing. Some of them, like Charles Dabney in Virginia, even gave them small wages. They could go to a store then and buy ribbons or fancy cloth or whatever it is that they wanted, right? So you could use the use the carrot, but the embedded option is if that doesn't work, then there's the stick, or more likely a whip. Uh, in the antebellum southern, right? But you could, you could force them to work harder, not smarter, but harder and longer, for sure. Uh, and, and they did. So decades of debate on this. The big thing, the general consensus is that slaves were more productive than free weight um, laborers because a uh, free laborer is gonna stop working at some point during the day. Slave can be forced to keep producing. Beyond that, there was uh, no, no real consensus. And then I come along, uh, along with this uh, other historian named John Majewski, and another one, interestingly also an historian, uh, who teaches uh, economics at San Jose University, Jeffrey uh, Rogers Hummel, and a public choice economist by the name of Gordon Tullock. You should recognize that name anyway if you don't recognize the other one. Um, so yeah, what about all the negative externalities and deadweight losses that forcing people to work creates though? Shouldn't we include those uh, in uh, any sort of um, any sort of uh, discussion about the uh, efficiency of, of slavery, the economic efficiency of slavery. Um, we all say, hey, hey you, using the same sort of logic with, uh, in the labor choice de demand model that I just showed you, uh, slavery is profitable for enslavers. Right? If, if it wasn't profitable, they would switch to wage workers or they would switch to indentured servants or family work or some combination thereof. Right? So we have no problem conceding that it's profitable, but there are lots of things that are profitable 
but that doesn't mean it helps the economy. Like all the rent seeking that goes on in Washington, D.C. Edit that part out. Uh, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> that's profitable, but that doesn't mean that it's good for the economy. No, no, no. So uh, what are deadweight losses? Losses incurred by one economic entity, you know, personal organization, government, whatever, that no other economic entity gains. Um, so a relative lack of civil society in the slave uh, South, for example. I've documented this in two books now. Um, there were fewer nonprofit corporations and fewer for-profit corporations per capita in the antebellum uh, South. Uh, and there's good reason to suspect that, that, that slavery um, was, the, was the cause. Lower literacy rates. Now obviously, you know, the, the one part of controlling slaves is not allowing them to, to read, right? So most of them were uh, illiterate, but not all. Some um, managed to work around that. But even among poor whites, the literacy rate was appallingly low by today's standards, and even by the standards of the time in the North, where we're approaching, uh, on the male side, you know, close to universal literacy, and even on the female uh, side, very high literacy uh, rates, but not in the South. And again, there's a very good, uh, you know, reason to suspect that slavery is the reason for this. Um, and then what about all the genius all the talent that's lost because it was never cultivated, both among the, the white trash, as Hinton Helper called them, and uh, amongst the, the, the slaves. Right? Well, um, perfectly, uh, the probability that they were you know, <laughs> capable of, of, of high intellectual pursuits, same as with whites, right? You see, have you ever read like Frederick, Frederick Douglass's speeches? They're friggin' brilliant, right? How many Frederick Doug Douglasses were out there who never escaped, never learned to read or write? How many uh, mathematical geniuses? There was one that came that came to light, um, uh, but uh, there were many, many others. Just died from a beating, or they ran off to a maroon community, uh, or they just labored their, their, whole, their whole lives and uh, ne never, uh, n never learned about um, those, uh, those things. The next, uh, the next cost, social co uh, uh, negative externalities, right? Social loss is not accounted for in market transactions like pollution, right? a negative externality. So what are the negative externality of slavery? Well, there were huge government subsidies that supported chattel slavery in the antebellum uh, United States and in other slave uh, societies. There are expenditures on creating and enforcing slave codes. There were public whipping posts. A lot of people don't realize this, but because you know they have a, a picture of, you know, the typical movie, uh, like, um, what's your name? Kunta Kinte, you know, and he's getting whipped until he finally says, uh, Toby, they, you know, they picture like the slave owner doing that. In uh, urban Charleston or, or New Orleans, oftentimes the, the, the men don't even know how to use a whip or they're absent and there's a woman in charge of, you know, 100 domestic slaves they get uppity, in other words, the control costs, they're resisting in some way, they need a whipping. Is some southern belle gonna come out in her bell, bell hop, pick up a cat of nine tails and you know, go to town on a slave? No, they had a public whipping post for that. All she had to do was take the slave to the public whipping post and say, whip. And then there was a paid public servant who would whip the slaves on, uh, for, for, uh, you know, on her uh, behalf. Fugitive slave retrieval um, and legal status trials. 
so uh, slaves would take the Underground Railroad, they'd escape to the north, um, and uh, resources, government resources were being used to retrieve them, send them back to the, to the master. There were instances where um, you know, uh, people would say, oh, this guy was my slave, right? I want him back. And there's these long legal processes while this poor, this poor guy is trying to prove that he was, he was born free. And this is before fingerprints, um, before most people had uh, photographs or daguerreotypes, whatever the, however that was pronounced, those old fashioned you know, pic pictures uh, being taken, uh, even before social security. How did we live? Oh, um, <laughs> so you know, how, how, how did one prove that one was a, was a, so a massive, um, uh, they would ban manumission or self-purchase. And the idea, manumission is when you, when you free a slave, maybe for meritorious conduct or maybe because um, you know, you've died, it's in your will, um, what have you. States just banned it and then would enforce those bans because they didn't want to have a lot of people with dark skin walking around who weren't slaves. Because what happens when the slaves see them? Wait a minute, I'm a slave, but he's free and we look alike? What's the deal with that? Also, uh, free slaves used to be the ones who would organize rebellions. Um, and um, uh, it was it just, just difficult then to tell who was a slave and, 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 and who wasn't. The biggest cost was probably the slave patrols. And this is where the poor white trash illiterates come in because the slaveholders would gin up any black sentiment, any slave sentiment, to get them to go out every night and patrol the neighborhood looking for runaways, looking for uh, potential rebels, or just generally you know, keeping, keeping order as they, as they called it. Uh, and so, this means, you know, the next day, what are these people going to do? The people, the patty rollers, as they were called. They going to learn to read? They going to work harder and smarter? No, they tended to get a jug of whiskey and drink it and go to sleep. Because they were up all night, <laughs> reducing the control costs for the slave owners. All right, um, so uh, I think this is a big curveball that comp complicates the reparations or the s s slave economic uh, output uh, calculations because these costs need to be accounted for in order to judge whether slavery as an institution was really efficient or not. We know it was profitable for the slaveholders, pretty darn sure of that, or at least for most of them. Um, we know that slaves could be forced to produce more, but especially when you add these costs in, it doesn't look like it was more, uh, more economically efficient system than wage labor. So, any questions? These are my three major publications in the area, by the way. Poverty of Slavery. This is bruised skin, by the way. Uh, Fubarnomics. Why they used, I wanted them to use Benjamin, you know, Benjamin's on there, but they used, they used dollar bills instead. Uh, has a chapter called Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is where that, um, that slave, uh, that, that labor choice model comes in. Um, this is where I develop, you know, the negative externalities argument. And then liberty be befits all. Do we know what befits mean here? because the freaking copy editor changed it all to benefits. <laughs> I went, no, <laughs> benefits, you yeah. know. Questions? Yes, sir. So I did a little research that was a while ago, and who knows what to believe about Wikipedia, uh, but is it accurate to say that back in the day when there were villas, the slaves that went with the villa were called villains? Uh, 
I, I'm not sure that that was the pronunciation, but there was this whole group in Europe called serfs, yeah. which is this in-between class that they were technically owned, uh, they were technically like not owned by a person, but owned by the land. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah so uh, they tended to have scores on my scale of like five or six. They had a little bit more volition than, than so a slave. They had to stay on the property. They had to stay on the yeah. property. If they managed to escape and they made it to a quote unquote free city, there was this, um, uh, and it, it sounds like a Nazi slogan. This is different though. Um, do you know German too? No? <laughs> Spanish is hard <laughs> enough, right? Machluft, Machluft, Fry. Free air makes you free. So if you were able to make it to a city for a year and a day, then that released you from those feudal obligations. Um, and also Holland becomes the world's first superpower because it created new land out of the North Sea that did not fall within the feudal system. Oh. That's where all the dikes and the windmills and all that, and the, the Dutch lore comes in. If you look at old maps, you know, the Netherlands was really this weird, funky shape that we wouldn't, <laughs> you know, but they, we, they were called polders. They would re and the land underneath was very rich agriculturally. Um, and so they, they thrived and other people are looking at this and they're like, well, is this because of the, the rich soil or is it because, you know, that's being worked by free, by free people? Um, and uh, eventually, you know, some, some in Western Europe, those, those uh, feudal institutions break down, sticks around quite a bit longer in Eastern, in Eastern Europe and in Russia. Um, Russia was particularly bad because not only did it have um, the, uh, the feudal system, they also had chattel slaves. So if you escaped to a city in Russia, you would probably go from being you know, a serf with a score of five to six to being a slave with a freedom score of like two. So that helped to keep that system together longer because you didn't have as many people fleeing um, and they're also not creating new land. And you know, you go too far east or too far north in Russia and... Cold. Yeah, <laughs> and, and not very fertile, so. Uh, so I want to talk about as a <coughs> slave efficiency question. Um, the, because it seems to me that if you own, say someone had a slave and I can force them into uh, the menial labor. Right. I didn't even monitor that. And maybe they'd be a lot more productive in something else but I can't make a contract that has them doing that. And so, from my standpoint, I'm actually, I keep them in the menial labor, and that's why it's probably it's less productive than it will be otherwise. So if we view that slavery as less productive, I'm sort of agreeing with the, the dismiss, but I think Mises makes that argument too. Yeah, um, so it turns out that most of the slaves were used in uh, menial, Agriculture, low, low. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Low, low skilled uh, agricultural labor, but there were slaves who were used in the South's small, but nevertheless extant industrial sector. So, like in the Tredegar Ironworks in Richmond, slaves were worked in there, and they, and they, they yeah. And they, they, there were contracts. Um, they're more like relational contracts than like the type of contract where the, because the slave can't, can't sue for, for breach. But the um, enslavers wanted them to do higher level work. And so they would promise them things like money wages and a little bit more freedom about town. Um, and, you know, if, if you're, if your alternative is being sold down the river and having zero freedom, being worked in a gang on a, on a hot cotton plantation, it looks like a really good deal to get some wages and a little bit of freedom in an urban center. So uh, the incentives to us look poor, but for them, 
It's a, it's a move up. And it's, it's very interesting. There were groups of slaves after the Civil War who opposed the end of slavery because it meant less freedom for them. <laughs> and these were the ones who were most free in the antebellum period, like the ones working on the task systems in the rice fields and the, and the ones in the industrial uh, sector because um, slavery, de facto slavery, did not end in the South with the 13th Amendment. It certainly didn't end with Emancipation Proclamation. Um, there are, are books with slaves, uh, books with slaves, uh, books with titles like um, a, a Slave by Another Name um, that describe how different um, social apparatus was used to keep blacks in servile positions. Uh, one technique was to arrest them for heinous crimes that they would commit, like loitering, right? Where do you work? I don't have a job right now. You're just hanging out, have no means of support, into the clink, right? Uh, you have a court date the next day. Well, there's legal fees, there's the fine. It's $5, pay up and you can leave. Well, this is $5, you know, it's like, it would be like 50,000 today. Well, I can't come up with that. Oh, well that's okay, because this gentleman over here will give me the $5, and all you have to do is go work for him for a year. Uh, and so that was the start of the convict labor system that went through several iterations and that we really didn't break free of uh, until about the Second World War. There's some classic movies you should check out, by the way, that, that show aspects of this convict leasing uh, system in some of its later uh, stages, like uh, Cool Hand Luke, because this was also used to ensnare uh, poor, poor whites, too. And uh, the singy one with the, with the handsome guy. Um, who, who art thou? Brother, who art thou? Yes. Clooney. Yeah. The soggy, soggy bottom boys. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, sla slavery in this, you know, this broader spectrum Set, d doesn't really go away. There's a movement afoot right now, by the way, to amend the 13th Amendment. Did you know about that? 13th Amendment is the one banning slavery. Do you know about this? You were shaking your... Yeah, it's not to bring slavery back, it's to get rid of the, the clause, except for... Uh, how does it go? Except for being du dutifully convicted of a crime. Right? That was the exclusion in the 13th Amendment. So there was a guy in a Toastmasters group I was in. He was a uh, deacon at the, the, the largest walled prison in the world at one point was Jackson Prison. And actually Ann Arbor and Jackson were in competition because it was really cheap labor. And so the largest prison in the world was still in Michigan and Jackson and it was to support Business. Is that the one that that uh, series is based on? I don't With know. the guy who got in the car wreck? Um, I don't know. It's on uh, Paramount. Um, Renner. Jeremy Renner. Does no one else watch TV here? That's good. You probably shouldn't. <laughs> Read books. Al. We're out of time, but just oh. stick around for additional questions. I just have one last one. That, uh, it seems like when you look at the productivity, Yeah. Then slavery probably just made Uh yeah, I think he probably did use slaves on um, those early uh, versions of Windows. Because <laughs> 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 they were bad. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to write a book at one time, and maybe will, about um, Hitler trying to use slaves to create high tech during the Second World War, and that did not uh, work very well because of this monitoring um, uh, issue. But it was even better than that. The slave owners themselves didn't even have to, 
to monitor. They hired an overseer, and the overseer would then hire drivers who were slaves, um, but slaves who had better quarters and better rations and better access to, to, to females who would do the monitoring. So most whips applied to slaves were applied by other slaves, which is reason number 743 why I can only give this talk in, in six places in the country. But thank you very much. I have nothing to do tonight, so if you have questions. Feel free to come on down and 